maybe intermediate to advanced steps that are tactical. And I think for me, one of the big things here is consistency. Creating a, I call it custom stock photography, is gonna be a really good move. More than that is thinking through the storylines and the narrative that you want this brand to represent. Um, the other thing is listen to what people are saying about you. Listen to what your patients say, your team say. How you know if you're growing is that you're uncomfortable and there's a level of urgency. Tesla knows the value of that product to their customer is more than just the value of the car. Welcome to another episode of Dental Marketing Go. I'm your host, Gary Bird. I am the founder of SMC National, where we help you create, convert, and close more new patients so you can grow the way that you want. And this podcast is all about tactical help to help you grow. And we only talk with the best of the best. And today, I have Mr. Joshua Scott, who's the CEO of Studio 88. And they are a marketing company in the dental world, but they're very, very particular about how they do their work. And you're going to see why. And he breaks down the three parts of scaling a brand, the visual, the verbal, and the values. And you're going to get a lot of you're going to get a lot of ideas from this and you're going to really, really enjoy it. I promise you that you probably haven't thought through your brand this way before. So make sure you stay tuned, hit that like button, subscribe, and stay buckled up because this is a fun one. All right, Josh. So tell me, let's start here. How do you scale a brand? And before we even talk about scaling a brand, what does that even mean? Like for our audience, what does it mean to have a dental brand and what does it mean to scale it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question, Gary. I, when I was kind of preparing for this thinking like, how have we scaled our brand? Because I, I don't know that I, I kind of intentionally went block by block when we did it, but, but we have, and, and how have we helped dental practices scale their brand? And really that's taking the kind of the, the hearts and soul and all that's in that one practice when you when you launch number two and three and then 10 and then 50, making sure that that's not lost. And so uh, I love uh, personal brand expert Mike Kim. If, if you've ever followed him, he talks about brand in three parts. Uh, the first being visual, the second being verbal identity, and then your third being your values identity. So I, I thought, uh, let's kind of walk through all three of those because oftentimes we think a brand is just visual, but really it's verbal and values as well and how to like multiply that across multiple locations. Yeah, I really love that. I love those three Vs. I, I, alliteration is awesome. So it helps you remember visual, verbal, and value. I was just talking with D. I did a podcast with her and she said she was on this whole thing of internal branding and what she was referring to is the scripting. Is is the person yeah. who's answering the phone saying the same thing as the treatment coordinator is the same thing as the hygienist is the doctor? And if not, you got to fix that. And that's that's how you really get a feeling inside of your office about your brand once the patient's already there. And so I, I love that conversation. So how do we? So using that framework, how do we? How do we visually scale a brand? Or do you have to start at your values first? No, I, I think let's start visually because that's what people often think of by default as your brand. And, you know, we get logo and colors and, and kind of all that stuff, website design and look and feel. But I want to I want to be super tactical. So I was trying to put, you know, kind of thinking outside of like, OK, base beginners marketing, like what are some maybe intermediate to advanced steps that are tactical? And I think for me, one of the big things here is consistency. Like it's easy to be consistent at one location. At the second, you start to see little things slip, the third, the fourth, and by the 10th, man, it's every day. You're seeing the, the font lo you know, looks different every time something <laughs> yeah. is printed, the logo stretch, there's different variations of it. And so consistency is going to be your key. One of the things I would encourage you to do is stop, back up, and put a brand style guide in place. You may not feel like it's necessary at location two and three, but man, as soon as you can do that, you know, just a PDF that defines this is how we use the logo. You never stretch it. On white, you use it like this. On black, you use it like this. Uh, here's the fonts we use. Like you've got two choices, guys. <laughs> you don't. Yeah. All those yeah. fonts in Microsoft <laughs> Word, uh, they're they're off limits, man. <laughs> we got these two fonts. These are the sizes we prefer, and you can really get specific so that anytime something goes out with your brand on it, it's going to look and feel the same way. So that for me, that's the first tactical part of this is consistency. 
Sorry to disrupt the show, but I got something crazy to share with you. We are attempting to connect with all of our listeners. We have thousands of people that listen to this podcast, and we want to meet you in person. We have four events coming up, and I want to give you a discount code that you can use for the next week to save $300 off your ticket. The discount code is Gary Bird, and the link is going to be just down below. You can also go to smcnational.com forward slash events. I hope to connect with you in person and help each other grow our businesses. Can't wait to see you soon. Do you, I, I know from like a designer standpoint, like Canva is probably not everybody's favorite thing in the world. But the one thing that I have noticed that they've added to their suites is that you can actually put your whole brand guide in there. So you can put all your colors, yeah. your logos, your fonts. So that way, if your front desk goes, no, I really want to make a social media post. It's like, okay, if you're going to allow people to do that, you have to have some way to control it. And so the PDF is huge. But then how do they get, you know, how does the person work in Canva or whatever they're using, right? And and they usually usually the people that are doing that stuff aren't trained designers and things like that. Right. So I right. love being able to control that um and and control that consistency across the board and everything that you're doing. And then so yeah, I mean, so we, let's just Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say we we actually have like, you know, our company Studio 88, we've got variations of our logo and so we're we're real particular like if it's an audience who really hasn't heard of us, We've got a logo the where it's spelled out, Studio 88. So it's real easy. But internally and kind of for our own tribe and clients, we have a shorthand, which is S-A-E-8. And people know what that means. So some of that for us is like, if it's this audience, we're using this brand. If it's this audience, we're using that brand. Mm, okay, awesome. So so just getting super clear on what, what you're using when, making sure everybody's aligned on that. And that you have some yeah. kind of governor on that, whether it's a marketing company that's doing it for you or you know, Susan at the front desk, that's her job that to make sure that this is all good. And then, and then what, what, so now let's assume, okay, I got five practices. I got my brain guide. I know what my colors are. I know what my fonts are. I know what my logos are. And, and, and I think that's where a lot of people are like, cool, I got my brand, like my brand's consistent, but there's yeah. a lot more to that after that. So how, how does that, what's kind of the next steps after that? Yeah, for me, I was trying to think of like, what are, what are the big kind of real value pieces here? I think consistency is number one. And, and even going as far as giving somebody that job of being the brand, uh, it's, not, it's not like brand enforcer. It's more of like a brand ambassador within the organization yeah. to, uh, to monitor that stuff. The second thing, Gary, is I think creating a, I call it custom stock photography is going to be a really good move. So what I mean by that is, is we know what stock photography is, but hire a photographer to create photography. Maybe it's in your flagship location. Maybe it's across multiple. Create a bucket of photography that now you can use as assets when building a website. Teams can use for posting to social media. If This will help, again, with that consistency because now we're using similar photos. Or it's a similar look, color grading, all that stuff. So we get that same kind of feel. The other thing I see, if you don't do this, you're leaving it up for team members to pull whatever image they want off the internet. And chances are it might be fine. Chances are it's not royalty free. And I've seen many legal letters <laughs> yeah, I've seen you that know, too. <laughs> come across going, hey, you're using this image. This is our image. And, you know, if you're a single uh, practice, it's, you know, probably two to four thousand dollars. Pay us and take it down and no harm, no foul. Uh, if you're a 50 location practice and you you're using an image across to represent 50 locations, um, you know, that fee can be can be 10 times that. Uh, and, and in the end, it's not really even a big deal, but it's the irritation and it's the it's the big red flag of we're not being consistent with our brand. Yeah. The other thing, too, that I've seen is you can get in trouble with the. Uh, um, um, HIPAA and stuff, right? Like your postings, maybe someone's yeah. like, you might have a really aggressive social media person in the office taking pictures and taking pictures of the patients. And it's like, they may be the best picture ever, but did you get the consent? <laughs> did you like, it's, it's right. tricky in, in medical. It's not yeah. as it's never cut and dry. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. That's actually a really great point. Okay. So, so now where do I go from there? So I got, so I got my brand I know, yep. I know what it looks like. I also have a bunch of photos that are already approved. Their patients have been, you know, they signed the, the waiver, the HIPAA waiver that it's okay to share. They're all styled properly. They're the right color. I, I haven't stolen them from somebody. I'm not going to get hit with a fine. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's the next step after that to kind of dial in your brand? 
So you, I, you know, let's move to, to verbal, that verbal identity, because uh, we got the visual. Those are some tactical things there to help. Uh, verbal, this is, is what your, uh, your, uh, your team, your doctors, your clinicians actually say about you. And uh, I, I love your illustration uh, or your uh, example of, of scripts. I think that's so important. Um, but more than that is thinking through the storylines and the narrative that you want this brand to represent. Um, I, I, you know, the day I kind of realized that a lot of people think story is just something that happens or like, okay, let me, what is my story? And they kind of got to look down on it. The day that I realized that I was in control of my own story, that I had agency over that to actually create it, um, man, that changes everything. And that comes back to this. What do you want your organization to be about? You've got control of those storylines, like, like put those narratives out there, support them, build them into your organization, because then your team will start to say that. Um, we just kind of came through a season here where we reworked uh, some things, uh, just kind of client facing, uh, reorganized packages to better serve clients. And we created four unique storylines around them that revealed in internally to the team. And they were like, yes. And we did some refinement, some back and forth, and, and then revealed them externally uh, to potential clients. And so it's like those types of things, crafting those statements, putting them into play helps that verbal identity. Yeah, I think this is huge because here's what happens and, and, and it happens in every business, and, but especially in dental offices because the dentist who's also the leader is usually really, really busy doing dentistry. And so what happens is you're busy doing dentistry and you're like, okay, come on guys, we got to get this done. You poke your head up and you're like, oh no, why? We're not answering the phones. We're losing thousands of dollars every time you don't answer the phone. What are you doing? Right? And then go yeah. down, do some dentistry, then poke your head up and you're like, what do you mean you just let the patient walk out? You didn't get this. We just lost thousands of dollars. And then what the story becomes, now you're not doing it on purpose, but the story becomes, this is all just about money. We're just here to make a bunch of money. And anytime we make a mistake, we're losing money. And I know that's not the real story, but that's the story that people are going to draw from those interactions that you have. And so being intentional about your story is so important. And so how... like. How would I do this? Like, how would I be intentional about my story? Obviously, I could talk to you. You guys are the experts at this, of really drawing yeah. out that story from people. Yeah. But even before I talk to you guys, where do I kind of wrap my brain around? What is my story? Like, we're doing dentistry. We make people smile. I know it's kind of funny. Like, everybody's always like, we're about smiles. You know what I mean? We want 10,000 yeah. smiles this year. But it, there's more to the story than that. H how do you yeah. draw that out of somebody? I think there's kind of two thoughts here. One is, uh, yeah, one, one is it's a process and chances are you're not going to get it right the first time, but you got to be able to just move towards it and keep moving down that road. Um, the, so creating like a tagline, I think for me is, is step number one. And, and we've all heard that. That's kind of marketing 101, right? Like what's your tagline? What's the hook? What's, what's the, the motto, whatever. But I really think putting it in one sentence, like what's the one sentence? What is the storyline? What's the narrative? Um, and, and honestly, once you have that, for me, that lives at the top of your website, like XYZ mm -hmm. Dental, mm -hmm. boom, here's, here's the storyline. And then that story gets played out then through the rest of the site. But the other, the other kind of key here, so, so I mean, think about like what it is that you want and, and really kind of work on crafting that. Like what's, what do we think the story is? And don't just Oh, it's this, but I mean, really think about how to craft that in a sentence. It's got some hooks to it. It's sticky. Um, the other thing is listen to what people are saying about you. Listen to what your patients say, your team say, Gary, I remember, I mean, it's probably about four years ago. We changed our crafted this official kind of tagline of dentistry story driven marketing agency. And because at the time everybody was coming to us and they're like, we love how you tell stories. And I, it's not like I probably didn't, it wasn't like I didn't get it, but back then I was like, yeah, we do that, but we also do marketing, you know? Yeah. And so, but they kept saying that back to us. And part of it was, I'm like, that's how we're going to position ourselves. That is the storyline we're going to embrace as a mm -hmm. marketing agency in the dental space. We are dentistry's story-driven marketing agency. So start with, we are what, what yeah. are patients <laughs> saying to you? What do the team say? You know? Yep. I love that. Yeah. So R just to help people out there, we, we used to have a much longer one, but our, we call it a company Y, but it's the same, same idea is that we're yeah. always growing, always growing. And it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that we want our team to always be growing personally and professionally. We want our clients to be always be growing. 
and we uh, by default the the result of that the company should grow right at least that's the idea behind it and so um and that's really important to us and that's something like i'm always striving to like what's the next thing where where are we going to take that next step and and i understand that's more like an entrepreneur mindset and that's we work yeah. really well with those kind of dentists and so i i love that and um you can definitely you can definitely get a lot of power behind that and if you and, and the one thing that i've learned you got to say it over and over and over again. If you want yeah. your team, you, yeah. it, it almost, I feel stupid sometimes because I uh-huh. like say it like every week, like, okay, guys yeah. are always growing. That means you have to be growing. The other thing that we've attached to this, that just popped in my brain is what does it mean to be always growing? Like, what does that actually mean? And yep. so we've attached two feelings to it and I might, this might be the wrong way to do it, but I would love your feedback on it. So what we, I said is that how you know, if you're growing is that you're uncomfortable and there's a level of urgency. If you're not uncomfortable, there's not, no growth there because growth is always uncomfortable. And then, yeah. and because you're kind of going to that next step, you know what I mean? And then urgency, anybody can say, hey, I want to eventually someday, I want to, you know, be able to lift, you know, I want to be able to bench, you know, 350 someday, right? Well, there's no yeah. urgency there. But if I said, hey, in the next six months, you need to be able to bench 350 all of a sudden you're like, Oh man, I better change the way that I'm training and start working on that right now. So that's, I I try to, we try try to attach emotion to, to it. So that way people know if they're living that out or not. So that's something that we've done. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that's the right way or not to do it though. No, I I, I love that. And I love um, what's brilliant about your guys's why or tagline always growing is there's layers to it instantly. And most of those layers are values. It's the foundation are, are all the different values. It's urgency. It's un- uncomfortability. It's entrepreneurship. It's uh, personal growth. It's business stewardship of grow- you know growing a business. So a lot of times that verbal, as you start to like put those things into action and go, okay, this is our voice. You realize there's values in that, and, mm-hmm. and that takes us really to our third point of your values identity. You know, um, and especially as you're scaling across multiple locations multiple teams, multiple clinicians, those things you believe, those things you do, it's like, here's what we believe as a whole. Here's what we do as a whole. And being able to represent that, um, that's that's a huge deal because we all know a visual brand uh, can get you so far. You know, I mean, the website can look amazing, man, and it can get patients in the door. But if that values brand isn't lining up, patients are going to see right through that. And that's oftentimes where we have that open back door is because it's a lack of values driving that practice in line with that brand. So yeah, you have an amazing brand visually, but you don't have the verbal and the values that, that match that. And that's where things get misaligned and patients, Really, they're they're expecting this, and they're coming in and getting this. It, we, it, and let me give you an example, and you can tell me if I'm on point with this. We've all looked at the pictures before of the most amazing hotel, right? And yep. it's like it's 500 bucks a night, and we're like, okay, that's expensive, but it looks amazing. And then you get there, and the carpet's dingy, and the it, like it doesn't line up. You paid premium, it looked yeah. premium, but you get Motel Six with it. That's and when you get Motel Six, there's nothing wrong with Motel Six because it's Motel Six, right? You expect yeah. it, but when there's that misalignment, that's where the massive disappointment comes from. And and I've had in just full transparency, I've done that before where we said one thing and we we expected one thing for a client and they didn't get yep. it, and because there was a gap there, they were disappointed in us. And patients go through the same thing. So I, how how do you? So is it just as simple as just acknowledging that? Hey the visual, the verbal and the values have to align or is there, is there something else that kind of puts a bow on it to put it all together? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question because I think this one's the hardest. Cause I think you can go, we look like this, we sound like this, but really values are, it's what you believe. And that's really hard to fake across other, like it doesn't scale well to other people faking what you believe. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what, <laughs> a great what does scale well is belief with conviction. Like that's people pick up on that, you know, that, mm-hmm. that can spread. So, you know, I think for us, like one of the things, so, so I, I think it's probably just, what do you believe? And let's have conviction around that. And let's really mean it. So for us, we value creativity. That is one of our highest values as a company. Um, you know, I would argue we're probably one of the more creative agencies out there. Mm-hmm. I don't just say that. 
I protect our creatives on the team. So for example, we have always had this, but like we have a eight client, eight new client maximum every month right now. That is what our creative team can handle. Our account management team can handle to not only deliver like adequate service, but like amazing service. And that's what we want. You know, then we'll make a hire and kind of build a, you know, another team and that capacity will go to 12 or we'll go to 16 or whatever it is. But we actually kind of go, okay, no, we actually believe this. So therefore we can only handle so many clients. Otherwise that creativity is going to suffer. And it's a lot of like, you know, a Chick-fil-A closed on Sunday. It's, it's decisions with conviction Mm. are going to be contagious. I just made that up, but that sounds <laughs> that's, that's like really, really good. good. It's yeah. so good. It's uh, that is so good. They have to be protected, and and then not just protected, but fought for. Yeah. So it's one thing to build a wall around your values, but it's another thing to take out the sword and the shield and go fight for those values. Like what you just described is Chick Fil A. You don't get to buy a Chick Fil A franchise and be like, "Oh, we're just going to be open one Sunday a, a year." You know what I mean? Like they're like, right. "No." You don't, you cannot be open. You can't sell anything that drive throughs are closed. And because they have that conviction, people talk about them. And even though they're only open six days a week, they sell more food than everybody else open seven days a week, which is absolutely wild, but it's because they have conviction and they fight for that value. And then, and then it equals results in their business, which is amazing. A hundred percent, Gary, I think what's even more impressive is it's one thing for them to have done that five years ago and said like, oh, this is how we started the company. What's more impressive is at the rate they're growing, they're scaling right now, um, the fact that they still have held to that. When it's it's millions, I mean, millions is probably even an understatement of dollars on the line for that. But it's the same thing with our, when our account management team, when we hit eight, you know, in in a month and we tell clients, hey, we'd love to start with you. We're going to have to, you know, it's going to be two months. It's going to be two weeks. It's no big deal. We're going to do some behind the scenes work, but we'll get you started this week. The account management team is like, Oh yeah, this is, this is legit. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's amazing. All right. I'm going to, I, I love this by the way, this is so good. I always learn so much from you. I love the visual the verbal and the values and tying that all together. I'm going to, I'm going to go off, off base with you a little bit here and yeah. uh, I would love your thoughts on this. Okay. So, um, we get this all the time. I want a Tesla website. I want a Apple website, right? I want an Apple website. That's what I want my site to look like. And what always, what I always we have to remind people is like, okay, great. First of all, the cost in that, right? Like this, the way they shoot their photos, all that stuff is really, really expensive. So that's number one. But number mm-hmm. two, they sell a product, not a service. And mm-hmm. number three, they're a global brand, not a local brand. Yeah. How do you compartmentalize that? I, for, first of all, do you get that question a lot? Can you, you know, can we, can you get a, get us an Apple website or a Tesla website? Like people, people ask for those kind of, those kind of brands. Do you, do people ask you for that? And then how do you, what's your answer to that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I would say number one, from our ends, you want an Apple product because you let Apple design it and deliver it to you. You want a Tesla product because you let Tesla design it and deliver it to you. So if you want a Tesla website, but yet you want to be involved in every step of the process, those two things are at odds with each other. Let a designer, let a talented designer, talented developer create, give them the license, the freedom to create and let them bring back to you. So that's probably number one is that type of person typically always wants to be the person with their hands in it, micromanaging. And in the end we get, we're far away from a Tesla site (laughs) when it comes down to it. Um, So that's number one. Number two, I would say Tesla knows the value of that product to their customer is more than just the value of the car. It's a belief statement, it's values, it's their position in the world and their community around them. So building a Tesla website, know that its value is not just in the website. It's in the type of patients it's attracting, their values, their position in the world around them. And a lot of times I guarantee, like, will you see more new patients come in from a Tesla website? Possibly. Are you going to see more ideal patients, more values-driven patients, more trust, higher trust, higher – a hundred percent. That's where we're really going to win on it. 
Mm, that's a great, great point. I love that. Well, as always, great job. Always learning a ton from you. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise with the world. If someone has questions or wants to learn more about like what you guys do or how you do it, or even working with you is, as long as you've uh, not exceeded your A, uh, how, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm best place for me is at Instagram at Joshua Scott. Hit me up. Tell me you watched this episode. I, I respond. I'm still in my, you know, social responding. Uh, and then studio 88 would be www s8e8.com so letter s number eight letter e number eight.com would love to connect with you there as well awesome thanks for coming on man my pleasure peace